Hello and welcome to Digital Futures. Next, another yet another session on uh, tutorial series. Before we begin this session, and I invite over Roberto Arguelles, who is joining us from uh, Guadalajara. Uh, I would like to just uh, give a very quick uh, reminder for our last sessions, uh, last tutorial series, which are available on our YouTube channel. And you can uh, check out some of our previous uh, sessions. Also, tomorrow we have another session with um, uh, organized by uh, Florida Institute uh, and the uh, DDES program, which will be headed by Professor Neil Litch with the, one of the D, uh, doctoral uh, candidate, Vanyu He. Uh, this series is a set of uh, 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 this series is a set of uh, 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 sessions which is based on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and at the intersection of uh, architecture. Also, uh, March brings in a lot of exciting sessions on various topics from clay printing in architecture to uh, our language session and our first ever language session in Portuguese, which will be held uh, on 19th of March. And uh, you can check out our uh, newsletter and subscribe for our newsletter on our website. Uh, we are also looking forward to new team members. So just a reminder, in case you're interested, you can always reach out to us on our Discord channel or, or reach out to us on our emails. Uh, without further ado, I would uh, take this opportunity to introduce a very interesting session, particularly because this session brings in a lot of interesting ideas which would help us to now build with uh, using Grasshopper workflow. Workflow is some of our basic tutorials that happened in the past covered uh, Grasshopper, Rhino. Uh, and this session particularly in is interesting because we will now be able to start making and reusing some of the materials and constructing with, the, with these workflows. Uh, Roberto, who has joined uh, uh, with us today, is has an experience which comprises of methodologies, techniques associated with generative design and digital fabrication for urban architectural and industrial design scale. And he also works with media arts. His work consists on research, teaching, project collaborations in Mexico, Spain, USA, India, and the Philippines with firms like Dune Lightweight Architecture, GG Architects, Nudes in the Classrooms, and the Bitter Tag uh, Farm. He founded Xenolab in uh, 2019 to further his research and work focusing on morphogenetic potentials of digital technologies and applications of design, fabrication, and analysis in order to search for new means and alternatives to achieve complexity. Roberto, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Velvin, and thank you all for uh, meeting us today. It's, it's an honor to be in this platform. Uh, Digital Futures has changed a lot the way uh, we learn architecture design and the digital means that goes along with it. And well, now it's time to, to give back just a little bit of what Digital Futures is just uh, already uh, giving, giving to all of us. Um, okay, well, I'm going to share my screen just to start the meeting let me know if you have any problem in in seeing it i am beginning with a presentation yeah we can see your screen awesome yeah good perfect okay well Bavlin has already um presented me uh thank you so much Bavlin, for, for for the invitation again i'm very grateful to be here and let's get to it um okay um I want to start with showing off a little bit of the work that I have been doing in the last um, maybe five years, uh, because I think that it's, it's, it, it has been important from, from, from a personal point of view on how uh, digital fabrication, digital design and generative algorithms, and also with, um, um, in company with, with a lot of, of methodologies that maybe uh, we could call maybe uh, conventional, but also very, uh, be, very uh, high tech uh, methodologies can clash one, another, one to each other. Uh, so 
um, I'm going to start to, to show uh, the first, uh, one, of, one of the first um, works that I've been working, working on. This was um, a sculptural lattice. We call this Awewete because uh, the concept that we, that we were looking for was to, to generate some kind of formalism accordingly to um, the, the morphology of trees, but uh, using it as a, as a lattice for, for an interior of a house. Um, this was built just one year ago, and we have uh, been working on uh, on a lot of, of points of the process since the beginning on the on the conceptual part uh, to the to the end on the fabrication and the assembly of the project. We have been um, uh, applying all of these techniques um, that goes uh, hand on hand with uh, with digital design and analysis and digital fabrication. So. Uh, first of all, we we liked a lot to to stretch the the way we we work with the projects, uh, even if we are not looking for this kind of of um, goals in complexity or or geometry intricacy. We are looking for possibilities at the end. So um, these first images are just uh, one are just a, a demonstration of what we can. Um, of what we can we, we can achieve maybe just on the on the on the digital aspect of it but um as well in the maybe um as a way to to experience some of the possibilities that we can achieve uh, on the material way so i have a little clip here just to show you uh how we were working with different parameters uh this sculptural lattice was made uh based on the on the Berlin noise uh, model, ma mathematical model, and what we, we what we did here was just a um, serialization of sections. Um, what we wanted to do was to look for the best shape, when uh, um, accordingly to the to to the complexity of the, of the of the waves, and also to the objective of the project that was uh, to try to capture the complexity of the of the morphology of of trees or vegetation. So here are several pictures of how the, the pieces were uh, fabricated. We were, we were, we were starting to, to make the, the serialization and the leveling of each pieces. And also one of the most important parts of it, it's, uh, try to, it's trying to, 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 to take back uh, the, all of the geometry and all of the ways that we have to to build it, we are always trying to to look for a way to democratize the information to the lowest um, to the lowest technical level possible, so it can be um, achievable and also to to be on grasp of whatever person wants to work on it, and also to learn from it. And these are the final photos of the of that project. These photos were were taken by Cesar Becher, great photographer here in Guadalajara, and he was able to capture most of the, of the finishing of this project. So maybe the scale is not very, um, is not very visible here, but this, this wall was um, almost four meters high by almost six meters uh, on wide. It was very large, but it was very interesting how the, how the complexity was achieved. And even if the, if the pieces were not that enough or were not that much as, when we were designing in the conceptual phase, uh, we were able to, to, to grasp a lot of details that were very pleasing for the client and also for the, for the piece itself. Uh, there has been also a, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities ongoing on different media while working on these kind of projects, uh, not only architecturally speaking, but also uh, talking about um, decoration and also uh, scenographics and props for stages. We are very close to this company called Lisergica 25. Uh, they do a lot of events here in Mexico, some of the most important uh, in the side trans uh, scene. And what they were asking us to do was to make um, some kind of, um, of a scenographics or a stage that they could be using 
a lot of times with 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 a lot of potential for different for for differentiation and also for more complexity even if they if they want or they need it because of the theme of the of the of the show or just for see what are the possibilities of shapes uh, to support all of the all of the event and the show that is doing the DJ and all of the production. So in this case, what we were looking for was, of course, to understand what, what is what is about the DJ stage and the scenographics that are needed for these kind of events. And then we were also on parallel trying to work with the most um, with the most freedom possible with the most possible freedom about uh, generating shapes and also trying to experiment with different kinds of morph morphogenesis uh, in case in, in, in needed cases because there are for example uh, sometimes that they want maybe to build some kind of spaceship and then the next event is going to be about um, the nature or maybe uh, even that or um, it's a lot of mixture on the on the on the teams that they work on and they need to have that kind of aperture on the on the on the objects that they have and they also want to to optimize uh, costs and uh, be able to focus all of those resources in other parts of the of the production so what we were looking for here was for a way to 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 build this kind of complexity in the most um in the most uh, simple way because also let, let's have in mind that all of the people that are involved in this kind of projects, uh, mostly they don't have any kind of construction uh, training um, previously to the to the event that they are, that they are working on. So what we were trying to do was to look for a way that could be very friendly for whoever wanted to to work on, and also give this potential and agency for the designers and also for for the for the for the producers to have uh to have them the the most flexible kind of um, of shape to uh, and be able to to transform it for whatever they wanted or they needed so what we were looking for here was to um take the shapes and take the the, the geometry itself using it as a mesh and then of course it depends on how many um triangles or quadrangles we have on the mesh the complexity of it maybe the curvature etc but what we wanted to look for here was for a way to build with very flexible joints or even not even using joints. It's more like uh, trying to use the same geometry of the, of the most um, essential part of the, of, the, of the structure and solve the, join, the, the joining between all of those modules with the most simple um, process. And what we, what, what we choose here was to use just a wash and a bolt but the complexity in this project was the way that we were looking for the angles, the differentiation of the angles between the, the, the extremes of the pieces, not only the length, but also the, the angle according to a, some kind of axis uh, that goes across of all of the piece and then define what is the angle precisely to, 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 to go along with the normals of the mesh that is, that is presented in each part of it. So, we were able to achieve that. We were able to, to, to generate a lot of complexity and a lot of possibilities by doing a lot of research and a lot of um, experimentation and a lot of prototyping. That was one of the parts that was most the, the most interesting part and also the most important because that was a way that we could that we were that we were we were able to to make the comprobations and the validations of the system. So what we achieved at the end was this geodesic sphere that we were able to uh, deconstruct as, as, as however we wanted and to use it in several different ways. Maybe as a dome, maybe as, as, a, as an habitable place, place, or maybe as an elevated um, a cover for whatever uh, space we needed. And also we were able to define uh, different aspects of jointing of joinings and also uh, for, for assembly for the different props that we were going to use in the in 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 the dome that 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 we were that we, that we were um producing for the for the for the company uh this was very interesting because we were we were work, uh, when we when we finished the the project we were able to do a lot of different props for maybe two or three years of um 
of the different productions that they have on their calendar and their schedule. And we were able to solve all of the all of their team all, all of their um, productions, uh, even with months of anticipation. And that was very very interesting. The, here are several pictures of the process when we were doing this uh, this scenario for for an event from Goa Hill. Goa Hill is one of the most um, famous DJs of the side trance um, scene in the world, and. When he was coming here to Mexico, um, uh, the, the producers wanted to make something very special and very big, so the, the event could be uh, very memorable. So here are several pictures of how the, the, the model was finished. Uh, let's remember that uh, there are a lot of artists involved in the process. It's not only maybe architecture or, or industrial design, but there are also the, the video mapping and the lighting design and the, the, the DJ itself that is looking for a team for its, for its show. And we were able to make a, a very good team. Uh, we were able to communicate a lot of the information and they were able to grasp it and to understand it. That was the, the most important part on this, pro on this project. And here is another um, version of the same project. We have the same dome, but in this case, uh, the spherical shape uh, completed, but with several props um, resembling a, a giant spider. In their words, it's like a robot spider that is coming to eat everyone. Okay, so um, now going going larger on the on the scale, uh, we also uh, go for. Uh, Go, go for working on, on, on different aspects of the architecture, not, not, not maybe a total architecture, maybe just parts of it. In this case, we were able to, to develop these tools for uh, flooring tilings. Um, this project was developed in a very large phase, in very large phases. At the beginning, when I was working for a, for a firm called GG Architects from, from Valencia, Spain, we were developing the, the, the first phases of the, of the, of the tools. And I rescued it for uh, using it in another projects, but the largest project where I where I've been, where I have been able to to use it uh, was on the first one with GG Architects. Here's a very little description of how the system works. We are looking for a for an equality of distribution of modules to to make it easier for the for the manufacturer to make the the tiles. And at the same time, we're looking for ways to, to redistribute those um, tiles in order to, to achieve complexity. So what we do here is just uh, divide the list in the, in, in this, in the same uh, number of lists of part or parts of the original uh, modules numbers, and then try to rearrange, rearrange the, the total of the, of the tiles in order to, to achieve that complexity. So what, we, what you can see here is, several versions, so, uh, experimental versions so on how the, the, the different tiles are being um, distributed. And here is a little video to show you uh, with, more, with a more explanatory way how, how it works. As you can see here, there is this curve that is representing the, uh, the attractor that is doing all of the arrangement. And you can see how the different tiles are, are being redistributed. Uh, accordingly to the position of the curve. So we are working with the jittering effect. At the same time, as we are working with a very with a fixed uh, number of elements, one for each uh, different element that we're working on. And we were able to um, apply this to on different projects. Uh, the the cool part of, of this tool of this tool is that uh, the geometry is the, the, the algorithm is not um, compromised with the geometry itself. It's more like a way to redistribute uh, lists or numbers in a matrix, and we are just um, we are just replacing numbers by uh, with with geometry, and it's very interesting how how we were able to to, to achieve the, the the complexity that was needed and, and desired on the design. Here are some tests of the first project with GG Architects. We were working on the on the architectural interior design of the. Uh, I'm going to say it in Spanish, el conjunto de artes escénicas. It's like um like like a theatrical complex here in Guadalajara. This was uh, built in 2017, and uh, the cool part of this project, uh, the one on the left, is that 
again, we were we were trying to to look for a way to open the the, the information for the for for the for the people that that were going to build this project, and they were able to to grasp it very fast because even if they if they looked at the shapes that were very complex, when they understood when they when they understood that there were only five parts five different parts on it, uh, as you can see here, the the widest part and the darkest part and in the middle of that range or domain, we have different um, variations of offsetting with with the combination of two materials. When they when they were able to 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 take count of that, they just uh, grabbed the map and they were even starting to play to just to guess what pieces was was coming from the from the last one, and it was very very interesting. And again, we were trying to. Uh, well, uh, from our end, we, we are trained always to 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 see where we can go with this, how far we can go. And here is just um, a very early uh, and conceptual um, um, design that we were just trying to play with it. Then this project that is, I think, the the the, the largest that I that I have been, that, that I have worked on. Um, we we had this commission of. Uh, designing and developing the solution for the sculptural membrane of this uh, new planetarium here in Guadalajara. It's called Planetario Lunaria. Uh, we were um, we were contracted by Dipro Innovation Design. It's it's a it's an industrial design firm that specializes in complex projects. So what we did here was uh, to intervene this uh, large dome. Uh, this was it was made of reinforced concrete, steel reinforced reinforced concrete, and it was very interesting because uh, the project itself, the, the 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 materiality of the project was very um, closed. Uh, the the limits between uh, the the interior um, the interior steel structure and the layer of of and the concrete layer was very thin and we didn't have a lot of, of, of uh, space to play with, uh, with the necessities that we had of making the perforations for the supports. So what we were doing here was first to know exactly where we had the, the steel by using magnets to make, um, to make like a magnetic scan, then using different uh, ways of scanning from, from conventional topography to 3D scanning in order to know where to where where to put the the perforations or where to have spaces to make the points for the perforations um, integrated with that process we were working on grasshopper and rhino and several other or other softwares to generate the triangulations we were working with the Loni triangulations and we were also uh, trying to make more uh, a more playful patterns with the with the glass sheets and the and the differentiation of the of the heights between each vertex of each triangle, I'm going to show you a little video on how it works. So, at the end, what we were trying to do was to first understand what we were what we were going to to achieve with this project to understand what the client wanted, uh, the com the concept itself that he he wanted to to make something that looked very chaotic, and at the same time order it. So. Uh, we just uh, solved, resolved in, in going for triangles to make it look broken or make it look um, um, like shifted and then uh, accentuate that, um, that geometry by, by, dif by differentiating the, the vertices of, of each uh, glass panel. And what we were trying to do here was to... Um, integrate a lot of systems we are we, we were having the supports that were uh, attached to the to the slab but we were also having this problem of how many how many glasses were um intersecting in each vertex of the of the delawney pattern and also we wanted i mean the client wanted to print on top of the of the glass some other patterns that i'm going to to show you just uh, in in several minutes so there were a lot of patterns um, being superposed in this project, and we were looking for a way to to make them uh, related, for in order to get um, a better way to in in order to get a better way to to serialize all of the pieces, make them related with with each, with each other, and also uh, try to have the best logistics possible for this for, for building it. 
so yeah this is a, a i'm showing here how the composition was uh, in 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 a general aspect we were doing the the, the Lowney triangulation of the sphere and then we just planted the the perforations for the supports of the of these what we called octop octopus octopuses that were uh, also supporting at the same time these uh, little rods. These rods uh, had uh, different heights, different lengths, in order to get this uh, very crispy um, triangular pattern. And also at the same time, uh, the client was looking for a way to relate uh, this shape with the team of the planetarium, the space, um, the, the the stars, etc. So what we resolved was to uh, imprint the the night sky and the stars constellations in the project um, we were looking for a date so uh, the client wanted to put the the spring equinox equinox so what we did was just uh, imprint that pattern on the on the glasses when we were able to do that we just made the nesting for each piece to to get it to get in it, it to different processes the glass cutting, then the printing, then uh, the perforations, and then the, the different assembly, the assembly uh, processes. Mm, I'm showing here just um, a little bit of the pieces that are involved on the, on the, on the, on the project. We were able to control every, each, each of every um, piece with it, each with, it, with its own uh, label and, and name and also its own relationships with the other uh, patterns that were superposed. Also, uh, on the, at the same time, all of the panels, uh, looking for a, uh, always looking for a way to resolve the, the relationship between the, each of the patterns that were involved on the project. So it was very complex because there were a lot of, of, of patterns involved and also, uh, again, this necessity of, of democratizing the information for the people that were involved in the process of the fabrication and the assembly. This is again, uh, just a little bit of playful um, renderings for the, for the project. And here are pictures of the project being built. So here are details of how uh, the, the, these octopi are uh, supported by these um, perforated um, uh, rods and also this barrel. And then each each octopi had uh, these different rods that supported each of the of the glasses. So this is this is a photo that you can use for giving you a sense of scale of how how large was it, was the project. It was very very big. Uh, we were using how many they were they were almost like um, three thousand pieces different pieces, but not all of them are, are different. And that's very interesting because what we what we did what what we did here was um, some kind of um, um, we did a similar pattern by quarters of a sphere. So we repeated uh, each part four times in order to get um, a more. Uh, in order to simplify the process of, of building it. But also we wanted to look for a way uh, to, to hide from the eye the repetition of each, the, the, the repetition of each of each um, of each piece. So uh, we were able to do it. Uh, here are some other um, pictures also. Um, there was this pattern they wanted uh, this uh, gradient of color. So each each of the triangles has a different color on it and also a different pattern printed on it. And it was a very interesting project. Uh, it, this was uh, inaugurated in 2018, if I'm not wrong. And yeah, that's it. That's um, that's a little bit of the of the work that we're doing on the on the firm on Cine Lab. And if there is any question, I will be happy to answer. Uh, so far, we don't have any questions, uh, but maybe okay. we'll have it soon. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Let's go for it then. Yes. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. Okay, then um, I'm going to start with the with, with a little bit of theory. I'm not going to get very deep into this. It's just for having a, a, a reference point to where to begin with. Um, 
the, the this this tutorial that we're working on it's going to be about um, how how materials how the scale and how the geometry uh, has a relationship a very tight relationship uh, when we are trying to build with it um, and I wanted to start with uh, talk, talking about uh, proto computation by using materials or 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 study models because I think it's very important to understand that uh, complexity uh, in, in, I don't know, uh, several, several uh, decades ago, or maybe hundreds, hundreds of years ago, um, we didn't have any access to, to any kind of, of um, machine that computes, that, that computes uh, this kind of information at the same level that we have today, right? So um, that, does, that doesn't mean that uh, we couldn't, uh, we, we are not able to, to use our, our, our ingenuity in order to solve that kind of problems. I think that Antonio Gaudí could be a very good start point. I mean, it's work. Um, we all know this project, La Sagrada Familia. Uh, in this project, he, he, he was um, experimenting with this uh, phenomenon called catenaria or catenary, uh, where you have uh, this line of, um, of a progression of, of enchained elements and when you support them on each extreme and let it fall just a little bit or let it, let, letting it hang just a little bit, it describes this shape uh, that is called a uh, catenary. And uh, Antonio Gaudí was very conscious about how this shape was not even easy to generate, but also was very uh, useful as a structural element or as a structural um as a structural description of shapes of structures themselves. So uh, when he started to work on their models, you oh, when you go to, 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 the, to, to see its work, you will be able to see these kind of models that are, do, that are done with ropes and with different elements hanging from them. And why he was doing that? Because that was an easy, the easiest way to, do, to, to use the catenary instead of just drawing them. What he was doing was to use the, the, the physical aspect of the of the catenary and, and, and the phenomenon the physical phenomenon of the catenary to generate these different um, uh, geometry physically speaking in, uh, and then generate the graphical the, the graphical information and maybe the the uh, and then the other details of it so it's very interesting and it's very important to have this in mind because we're going we're going we're going to see a lot of um, of progress from this part um, I, I'm not gonna uh, get get more on this. Uh, also, uh, Fray Otto, I think he's a, the uh, Antonio Gaudí was a precursor, I think, from from the from the works from Fray Otto. Fray Otto took the the next step on the proto computation by using materials to simulate um, shapes by, phenom by by physical phenomena, and these these projects that he even filmed uh, in, in in several videos for the Institute of Lightweight Structures are a very uh, important demonstration on how uh, these kind of uh, prototypings, not only models, but prototypes are very important for the design process. Um, we, with these processes, we're able to, to compute, to compute uh, shapes, informal shapes. And I think that it's, that's very important in, in, in the next steps of the, of, of the, of the architectural um, generation. I'm going to, to put here a little video it's very famous about how he was using um, different materials like soap, for example, to make minimal surfaces, defined by the by different uh, contours, fixed contours, and also how he was um, working with um, the, this um, superficial tension that the soap has in order to get uh, different shapes and not not. Not, not, not by looking it uh, by using maybe uh, mathematical methods, very, very rigorous, but more like using the material to to generate it um, faster and even more elegant in a, in a more elegant way. He was able to to generate these shapes because of he, of his compression of his compression of, on the materials, and I think it's very important to have this in mind uh, to go further in the in the next steps of of, of architecture itself. Um, okay, I'm gonna just leave it uh, a little bit. 
I think it's very interesting. It's, it's very, very pretty how the shapes are, are done and how um, with, with a very simple um, systems like just rods and cables, he's able to generate these very beautiful and very complex shapes that are not very easy to do on the on a computer, maybe in, maybe on that time. Right now, I mean, we have a lot of tools that already give us a lot of um, of a speculation on minimal surfaces and and tens and tensile structures, but at that time, this was uh, revolutionary. And I think that the next steps that that were taken from this from these um, from these studies are, are very are very important as well. Um, Mm, I, 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 I cannot think on, on materiality and design on hand if I'm not thinking about maybe Saha Harit code or digital building technologies. Um, Patrick Schumacher and his, uh, and his discourse about um, tectonism is, I think, one of the most important um, um, discourses about how the materials see themselves and, and the information that they have um loads with a load with, with a lot of, of of aesthetic potential and also agency for for for, for a further uh, not only proposal uh in in, a, in the geometrical aspect but also aesthetic uh, but, but also maybe um as a new movement and we are we are we are we are already looking the the, the effects of the of the of of that kind of of design that is backed with the uh, with the studies and the comprehension of the systemic behaviors of materials. And that's it. Okay, so uh, having that in mind, then I, I want to also um, take note on how the design strategy is one of the most important, if not the most important par part of any process on digital design. Um, the 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 easiness of integrating information on the computer, or by using a, a, or by using computer assisted design nowadays, uh, gives us gives us the opportunity to not only uh, design arbitrarily, but also uh, using information of every aspect uh, simulated by the computer and interpret interpreted uh, in a numerical way to use it for whatever means we want. So. Having that in mind, having 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 that having those um, um, advantages in mind, we can we can also uh, ask us how how I can use that information in the in the other aspects or, or the other phases of the design. Maybe not only on the on the on the generative design or, or maybe the early phases of the design, but also on the rationalization and the construction processes. So. Even if we have uh, the tools for for in the, in the early phases to to use to understand how how are we doing the the, the things that we're designing or how, or how are they going to behave in a simulated um, system, we can also have um, the opportunity of making uh, these kind of of simulations back it with a with a materiality aspect or the, or or the or the rationalization process by prototyping. In order to uh, understand again the systemic material behavior of, of what we are building, and also to not only verif verify but also reintegrate for for further iterations. By prototyping, we we make comprobations of what we wanted to do and if it is viable or not, and also in this in this way we are also able to uh, to make the verification on how the documentation has to be. And we we can start to ask to ask us the questions: How, in what level of complexity, or in what level of of um, um, in what level of um, how to say it? In, in what level of, of complexity of what is written or what is um, or, or what is counted? Do I have to? To share it with the people that is involved on the several processes, how easy is to read it. So, when we start to make uh, the process of construction, even if we are not looking for, for for keeping these uh, prototyping processes again and again and again, 
and not finishing the, pro the project itself, we can at least uh, verify as well any uh, any any different um, phase of the construction um, stage. At the end, um, having uh, been able to, to jump from one phase to another or from one aspect to another of, of the design, from, from analog to digital and back, we are able to understand better the project and even uh, perfect it in, in when, whenever we have an opportunity. <clears throat> so now uh, um, we, we can start uh, to ask us uh, the question, okay, I understand that I have to analyze. I, I understand that I have to, to, to have a, a full conscious of, of, on, on what kind of materials I'm using and how, how they can be used. But one way to understand it even better, it's to maybe make uh, some kind of, a, or, or of allegory or analogy uh, by using um, geometrical hierarchy and also scalar hierarchy for the material rationalization process. So, if we understand that uh, in the construction, the the different pieces or the different parts of the of the of the thing that is built uh, is is formed by different elements that we can rationalize as maybe points, line curves, planes, or volumes, or maybe volume systems. We can then not only make a reading or of of what we are going to design, but also we can write what we are going to design by using these very um, uh, abstract, uh, uh, abstract parts of the geometry. So we can see maybe the point um, as a as a perforation on a wall, but also we can see the point as a as as an structural joint for a for a special structure. We can see the curves or the lines as if they were steel beams for the for for, for whatever building we are doing in a conventional way. But also we can see them as if they were cables that are tensioning for supporting the, the, the things that are being loaded on it. We can also see uh, the planes or the surfaces as if they were uh, as if they were walls, but also we can see them as if they were covers as large as we can as, as we can manufacture them. And also, why not? We can see the, 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 the same volumes as, as, a, as a modular block for building similar shapes in a very small scale. But also we can see the modules, uh, the volumes as modules of larger scales, like for example, um, entire houses. Maybe this this uh, take us takes us to 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 several questions on what other uh, geometrical orders are being are being there uh, to describe the new different ways to build. And I mean, right now we are we are we're working a lot. Uh, I mean, I mean, not, maybe not me, but. Um, generally speaking, uh, in architecture, we are, we are a lot. Uh, we are experimenting a lot with different um, and more advanced uh, geometrical systems, like for example, agent-based design, or maybe um, uh, field theory applied to geometry. And I was I, I wanted to, to 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 give place to this kind of design, right? Like for example, um, geometry that we can that we can see on the nature. Outside, we can also um, not only um, mimetize it, but also understand it to make even more complex geometry. And why not that even we can have uh, not only a volume or three three dimensions involved in it, but also maybe time, and also maybe performance as new dimensions of this new order of of this new geometrical order. So, in conclusion. We can see these um, three aspects of building, prototyping, and designing, uh, going backwards, um, very, very hand on hand and very tightly uh, related. The material systemic behavior, the general and particular geometry of the of the of the system that we are building or designing, and the scale of it. But also, on the uh, by using the experience that I that I have um, that I have uh, gotten from the projects that I have been worked on and and the and the projects that I that I've been involved on collaborations or whatever, I think that there are also there, there is also a very important part of embracing the imprecision and the improbability of the systems because we don't have the full consciousness of what is happening with that material. We can measure them in several scales, but not on the on, not on the entirety of it. So embracing imprecision. It's very useful in order to generate systems that are viable, because mostly exactitude 
is not the best way to solve them. We need to have this uh, span of error, a span for maybe uh, making it flexible to making it move, etc. We can see a lot of examples out there. There is also a need for democratization information. Um, why? Because not everyone is specialized on, 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 on the building of complex geometries or complex architecture or complex design. Uh, we need to look for ways to, to, to make people understand in the most um, broad way uh, how the geometry and its complexity is working. And because we have a lot of people involved in different, in different stages of it, we need to make, to, make it, to make the information readable for them. From the, from the person that is managing the project to the person that is putting a bolt on the, on the structure. And this goes along with the transparency and the direct integration in every step of the process. And at the end, I think that you know, the most important part of this, of, of this kind of processes is to provide agency to, to hybridation from no tech at all to low tech to high tech and pure tech. And that's it. So with this, I conclude uh, the, the very, very brief uh, theoretical, theoretical aspect of the, project, of the, of the tutorial. And if there is any question that you have, please uh, feel free to ask. I will be glad to, to answer whatever you need. Uh, no questions so far, but uh, let me know when you want me to post uh, the files for this tutorial. I can share okay. it soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Olin. Yes, thank Perfect. You. Let's go. Can then. I ask you um, a question, please? Yes. Yes, uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, and you said recently that uh, we can use all kinds of this uh, formality with uh, natural behavior. Um, in cases uh, to bring more natural design uh, in real life. Uh, you believe can train the new technicians how to build them? Because I'm living in Greece and uh, I want to design uh, like this, this these formal these forms, but I think the the most uh, difficult part is how to explain to a technician how to build yeah. it. I think the best part uh, I heard in the past in a seminar is from Iranian architects uh, that said, uh, we use uh, a, a way that we explain that carpenters to make carpets in, in case we have a complex geometries. What about in uh, your occasion? Thank you. Well, no, no. Thank, thank you, Marius, for the for the question. I think it's very interesting and it's a very um, important question. Um, in in places like like here in Mexico, for example, um, I mean, th there has been uh, an advancement on the on the processes of building, but that has been only on very uh, on a very small um, fraction of all of the buildings that we're doing now. Uh, maybe uh, political aspects, maybe social aspects. Uh, are not giving the opportunity to different aspects of complexity to develop, but there is complexity uh, in every part, right? So um, one of the things that happened, um, if you allow me to go back to this um, slide here, I think that this is, um, I think that this could be the key of this of, of that question that you have, Marius. Um, I mean, in my, in my experience, of course, uh, giving the opportunity to, to any kind of, of, of artisan, even if it is a, a, a good worker or maybe a stone worker or whatever, uh, giving, the opportunity, give, giving him the opportunity to, to deal with these kind of projects, will you, you will give him as well the opportunity to think about it and to reflect on it. When you expose the people to, to different problems that has to be solved, you are providing the opportunity to make them, to, to make them use the, their ingenuity and make them, make them try to get in communion with the, with the way you're thinking. So in my experience, being very close to the, to the people that is working to, to learn from them because 
there are a lot of people of things that I that I'm not able to to read as a as a, as, as an artisan because I am a, I'm, I'm a designer mostly. But when I when I get into when I get my hands into the material to understand its properties and how it behaves and how long and how far I can take it, I think it's a very good way to communicate the possibilities of the project itself. Uh, even if you can, if you see projects uh, uh, very very complex and very intricate pro pro projects uh, outside of of your place of your country city, uh, as I have seen it uh, since I started uh, studying architecture. I think it's the curiosity and the, the need to know the best way to the, the best way to, to achieve that kind of, of reading. I mean, there is a lot of technicalities on how has to be how has to be drawn the drawings or the details for that kind of people that is not um, uh, that is not used to this kind of geometry or how how many pages I have to make the document for them to, to use it and to understand it. Will they will they read it at all? Th those are the questions that you are only able to answer when you get uh, your hands into the into the into the project and the material, and work with them. I think that's the the most important part. When you work on every level with them and outside as a designer, I think that's 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 a place when you are going to to look to to find the way on how to make them uh, communicate the uh, make them understand the project. I don't know if that answer um, answers your question, Marius. Uh, yes, in a bit uh, a prism of our of my, but I I have uh, I have a problem. Uh, I'm working in uh, construction uh, industry, which uh, focus on consulting part, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, and. Um, Every time uh, we try as architects to express more difficult forms uh, or something like that, or tensile, uh, tensile structures, uh, we have these, uh, these boundaries uh, between the communication of the project uh, with the technicians or the other architects that, that uh, are cap that uh, we critique our project if is uh, buildable or not yeah uh, uh, the public services uh, <laughs> the public friend <laughs> bureaucracy yeah, uh, but uh, the, yes the, this is a uh, this is uh, this is why my question uh, focused on uh, the communication part uh, of our design this is the thing uh, because we have to communicate our designs uh, even in technicians uh, or to, uh, both to technician and uh, our users too. Mm -hmm. and, and the house build part is uh, very interesting and very key, uh, complex. <laughs> thank you very much. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Marius. Uh, thank you for, for your question. Someone else has any other question? Okay, let's let's go for I'll, I'll take up the questions in the chat while you begin the yes. recording. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you, Berlin. Okay, I'm finishing this um, presentation. I just wanted to um, give the last picture just to um, uh, give you a, a a glance of what we're going to do today. So uh, this workshop, uh, this little webinar, it's uh, between basic and intermediate level. We are gonna we're gonna deal with uh, basic information and measurements of um, of geometry. Uh, the complexity of the geometry is gonna be um, is gonna be coming out from catenaries or relaxed meshes or uh, forms that are that are being generated by by, by a physics simulation. Not uh, not with a lot of information or uh, like contextual or material, but just. Um, uh, quantities of tension or quantities of linear element length, etc. But um, the I, I, I want to I want to accentuate the second part that is going to be uh, these fabrication schemes principles when we are going to to look for ways to to maybe uh, on a first hand measure linear modules, look for ways to make reciprocal uh, networks between lines to describe meshes, 
then make a little bit of mesh unfolding and module generation and assembly. Um, always focus it in these uh, different um, geometrical hierarchies. Uh, what we are going to look for is for a way to read the project, then look for opportunities on the different on the on, on their different uh, geometrical aspects and hierarchies uh, that are involved in the, in the geometry itself, and then um, decide what to read to understand what to build. So uh, all of the information is gonna be shared with you. Um, the, the model that I'm going to use here is gonna be um, shared with you as well, and also the algorithms. These algorithms are, all, are everywhere on, on the internet, but I just uh, made uh, some kind of curation on, on, to, to have them um, nuclearized in this, um, in this GH uh, file for you to use it. So what I'm going to do now, it's a demonstration on how to generate first geometry by using these uh, three first um, algorithms that are based mostly on Kangaroo. Uh, one is a catenary generator. The next one is gonna be a mesh relaxation. And the next ones are gonna be module generators for meshes, quadrangulars or triangulars are gonna be very, uh, they are gonna be very, very, a very simple, um, a very simple scheme of, of modules, but at the end, this kind of, um, of methodology is going it's able to be applied in different aspects or even more complexity if you if you want. So feel free to do whatever you want with the algorithms. The second part of the of the of the demonstration are gonna be about a fabrication schemes principles. First, we're gonna make an early data data measurement, uh, depending on the on the objectives of the building itself. Or, or, the, or the system that you want to build. Remember what we are going to try is to read the geometry, to look for its hierarchy, for its different hierarchies, and then uh, decide which, which information to use to, even, to make maybe more complexity on more geometry in, in, in further phases, or maybe just only measure uh, several aspects of the geometry as it is to build it uh, as it is as well. We're going to make um, a little model for rigid linear modules to know how to extract them from the mesh, label them, and also know how, how, many, how, how much they, they measure on length, but also maybe make some, some different evaluations on, on maybe comparison on, on length uh, between the system, maybe uh, color, colorizing them in order to know where are the, 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 most, the longest uh, modules, where are the, the shortest long modules, and to know uh, what what label has or what 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 are their their IDs. Also, also I'm sorry. Uh, on the next part, we're going to make an interpolated mesh network, where we are going to make not only linear, the linear modules between the, the uh, in the edges of the mesh, but we are going to unify uh, by by um, directional topology. Uh, the different edges of the meshes so we can have a cross network mesh to join and to know in what length of, of each line we're going to join that the, the, the cables with each other to generate a static um, mesh uh, with a different um, scope not not by not by modular not, not in a modular system but more in a lineal way to to uh, we're going to try to solve the mesh uh, length by length uh, on on the on their topological um, direction, and then we're gonna try uh, different uh, ways to unfold meshes. Uh, what I have here is a summar uh, is a very summarized version of of IV, um, for for making a more particular ways to 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 unfold meshes, but also I brought uh, the the fox stripper and roller in order to use it in a more um, easy way. Also, remember, there are, there are a lot of ways to make unrollings. There are a lot of libraries already on the internet. What I will suggest you is not to stay with only these uh, uh, tools in case you are just starting uh, um, with Grasshopper and with this kind of geometry, but look for, for even more optimal ways to, to generate all of this information. Um, also, have in mind these, these tools are not as elegant as maybe most of you uh, could be able to arrange them. Feel free to, to do whatever you want with them. They are for you. And if you see any uh, discrepancy or if you want to, if you have any question and if I can help, 
And if I can do something for you, please let me know. You, 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 will, be, um, you will be handed my contact in case you want to, to, to have a chat about this or even if you have any, any question about it. Okay, so let's begin then. We have one hour to make uh, uh, to, to use all of these uh, tools. I'm going to make a very small uh, demonstration of each one of, of each one of them. And if you have any question, feel free to stop me. I'm also showing off the different uh, keys that I'm that I'm uh, um, pressing while working. So in the in the recording, you can know what I'm doing with my mouse and what I'm doing with my keyboard. Perfect. So let's go for it. Okay, first we are going to, to make a form finding process, process by generating a catenary. Uh, one of the, I think the most important uh, part of this, um, of these methodologies is to have very, is to have a very, um, a very uh, sorted way uh, to organize the the layers because we are gonna deal with a lot of information now we're gonna generate a lot of uh, support information in order to generate the, the catenary like for example anchor points vectors uh, the catenaries themselves when they are generated or the or the base surfaces uh, so try to have uh, your mo your model when, when you start this from scratch try to have your model uh, very well sorted on the on the layer aspect and and yeah that's it. Let's begin then. Uh, this is, of course, just a, just a suggestion. This is what I have learned uh, in, in all the years that I've been doing uh, this, this little tutorial and these workshops. Uh, and remember, this is only a way to do it. Just uh, try to um, experiment with your own. So what I'm going to start with now is first a surface. Um, you can also input a mesh. Actually, uh, if you want to look for, if you want to use a custom a custom shape for the for the catenary generation, you can also do it because in the algorithm there is a way to to bypass uh, the part where where the mesh is being generated. Uh, the only important part here is that uh, is, uh, try to stick uh, with one kind of geometry at the time, and um, just uh, be be very conscious on what it's uh, being referenced on the on the components before uh, connecting something different. So to begin, I'm going to start with, uh, with a surface base in, a, in order to use the most of the algorithm. And then I'm going to show how to use just a, a base mesh in case you want. So I'm going to make a little bit smaller the grasshopper and I'm going to draw a surface here. I'm going to generate it by using the command plane. And I'm going to make a surface of 10 units by 10 units, uh, just to keep it simple. Then I'm going to select the, the surface and then I'm going to reference it to the, to the algorithm. Right now, it's already um, being executed in several, um, in several components, not all of it, because we need uh, more information. Well, now there is information uh, referenced here, but I had I I I I needed to to clear the values. Uh, you're gonna find it uh, already uh, fitted with information there, in order to to get the the demonstration work. So what I did first, again uh, recapitulating, was to uh, reference the first the the first surface here, and then. In the algorithm, you're gonna be able to change the quantity of of of, of um, faces on the on the mesh that is being generated. Right now, the the mesh control is being integrated in both counts U and V, but you can also um, differentiate if you want it. Um, I will suggest to begin to start maybe with 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 a small number, maybe ten to begin, and then go further and further. Uh, in case maybe that your computer is not uh, too fast or maybe uh, it lacks of, of resources. Also, have in mind that these kind of, uh, of, of simulations are a little bit uh, too, rush, too rough for the computer, so uh, keep it simple at first. So when we have the, the surface already uh, being converted on a mesh with the count already uh, defined by us, 
you're going to be able to uh, have this component um, working. And in this component, we're going to have the initial control points. But uh, the uh, not, not the initial control points, it's more like the, the, the um, vertex points from the meshes. But we're going to be able to uh, bake them and then choose which are going to be our, our uh, anchor points that we're going to use for the, for the algorithm. I think that I'm going to use maybe 20 just to, to give more, more um, softness on the mesh. Remember that uh, the meshes are going to be more soft, uh, are going are gonna to be more soft as they are more resolved. So you need more subdivision uh, to get uh, this kind of, of, of uh, softness that maybe you will be looking for in this kind of shapes. So I'm going to stick with 20 on mesh subdivision. And then I'm going to bake first these, um, these vertex points. I'm going, to, I'm going to right click on it and then click on bake. And then look for the, um, for the, for the layer that I'm going to, to work in. So right now in the catenary generator uh, layer, I have uh, different layers that uh, that are that are designed accordingly to the different geometries that I'm going to be generating. I'm going to put all of the all of the points on the control points um, layer. I'm not I'm not going to group them. I'm just going to put OK on it, and then I'm going to close Grasshopper enable in order to, for you to see the control points already baked. So. In this case, when I have this, this already baked, I can, by, by having Grasshopper closed, if you want, uh, define what are gonna be my control points on it. Right now, I'm going, I'm gonna make something uh, quite simple. Remember, just to have this uh, understandable for, 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 for the newbies. And let's go for it. I'm going to choose um, four points on each, on each side of the corner. Right now I'm doing a additive selection by pressing control, I mean shift by at the same time of, of making the selection of only the, the elements that are gonna be inside of the box, of the of the selection box. And then when I have the the selection of what what of the points that are gonna be my new my new anchor points, I'm gonna copy them on this on this next layer that is called grouped anchor points. Why I'm going to copy them? Because I want to get rid of the control points that are that are uh, left there, and I just want to stick with the with the new anchor points, with the new control points that are going to become my anchor points uh, in the next phase. So I'm going to copy these objects to this layer, and then I'm going to uh, turn off my layer of control points. Okay, so now. Uh, for, for a more easy um, manipulation of the anchor points, I will suggest you that if you are uh, sectorizing these uh, control points of anchor points, um, group them in order to uh, move them at the same time when, when, you are, when you start to edit the mesh when, it's being, when, when the catenary is being generated. So when I just uh, finish it, uh, the the grouping of the anchor points that I'm going to use for the for the catenary generation, I'm going now to select them from the layer that I have here. Select some layer objects. I have more uh, control points here, so I'm going to keep them out from the selection. And then on the anchor point referencing um, referencing uh, component, I'm going to set multiple points in order to internalize those th th that data in this component. So uh, these are not, <laughs> they, they don't have any reason to be there. Uh, so the anchor points now uh, are internalized on the, on the algorithm and they are being read by the, by the algorithm themselves. They are being um, interpreted, inter interpreted as uh, anchor points. And when I start the, the, the physical engine simulation, you're gonna see how the catenary is being generated. So what other um, parameters I have here to, in order to, to change the shape of the catenary? Well, you have um, three, three more um, parameters. There is one parameter that is physical. I mean, uh, that is being drawn on, on Rhino and it's these couple of points. I'm going to explain what it is. Just let me move them to this part. Okay, with these two points, I'm, I'm making a vector. Why I'm making a vector? Well, 
maybe um, I, I want to play a little more with this uh, with this catenary, and I, I'm going to change the axis of the of the unary forces that are being uh, applied to the to the shape of the catenary. Uh, the the force of the vector is not uh, integrated by its length. You can control that with this slider, with the unary force strength uh, slider. Also, you can change the linear element length factor if you want to make um, a, if you want to put a, a limit, a lower limit on the, on the sizes of the, of the linear elements. Like for example, if you make them larger, the simulation is gonna try to have all of these linear elements always larger than this number. So in the inverse, if you put it on zero, the simulation is going to try to 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 make them um, to make to, to make them uh, have the zero length, and in that case, uh, you can maybe understand this parameter as the rigidity of the of the mesh that is being generated that, that the catenary is being generated from. Uh, it's like if it was very very um, hard to to enlong. So, I mean, it's just a matter of whatever you want to do now. Um, I will suggest also that um, let the, the, the engine to work a little bit, maybe um, just until, until you see that the, that the geometry is not moving at all. And then you can double click on this Boolean toggle to pause the, in order to pause the, the simulation. And then you're gonna be able to bake this um, geometry. I'm gonna click, right click on this and then press here on bake. When you press here, bake, you are going to be able to uh, to generate the geometry that is being simulated. I'm going to put it here on the generated catenary layer, sub layer A to A. I press OK, and that's it. Now, remember that uh, we grouped these uh, anchor points, and we did it be because of this reason. I'm going to keep uh, running the. I'm, I'm going. To, I'm going to turn on the the. The, the simulation again. And I'm going to move now these two um, anchor points groups. So in this way, you're gonna be able to um, play more with the, with, with the catenary. You're, you're gonna be able to, to define where the, where the supports or the anchor points of the catenary, it's gonna be uh, uh, planted. So in this case, I don't know, maybe I want to make, uh, I don't know, maybe an, a, a very wide entrance in this dimension, I don't know. And I want to contrast that, that uh, very large span with, the, with a very small span here. And I'm gonna maybe accentuate a little bit the, no, maybe to the other side. I'm going to accentuate a little bit this entrance by changing the vector. And then I'm going to change a little bit the, the, the strengths. So in this way, you are going to be able to 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 change the the the, the geometry. I'm sorry if my computer is a little bit uh, too slow. It's because I'm asking too much, maybe to my machine. Okay, I'm happy with that shape, and then I'm going to bake it. And this one will be maybe here in A to V layer. I'm gonna stop the solution and that's it. Let me see if maybe I have another simulation running. No, I think that. Okay, it's because very strange. I don't know how. I don't know why it's so slow. Okay, so I have here another another uh, catenary. It's very easy to 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 define, and. I don't know. It's just a matter of playing with it to see what is what is achievable. So now uh, several several uh, warnings about uh, using the 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 kangaroo solver. Uh, when you uh, when you start the, the the simulation, kangaroo is already reading where the anchor points are are being held. At. So if you change them, if you change their position while the simulation is stopped or paused, you can, you, you can change uh, in that way the, 
the 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 placement of the of the catenary and also maybe uh, have uh, a more uh, intelligent way of working this uh, for not to 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 spend all of the all of the resources for, from your computer. So you can do or change you want. You maybe can uh, pause it or uh, and then change and then unpause the the solution. Or you can do it uh, in live by uh, while the while the simulation is running. But there is a problem. If you reset the the, the simulation, the points are not going to be um, referentiated to it anymore. And then uh, where the where the control points were changed from their original position, there are not there are not going to be any support from it. So be careful on what on where are you going to put the the points. So you don't lose the mesh or maybe even crash your computer if the simulation goes very fast and very hard on it. So what I would suggest is that you always do is that you always have maybe one copy of your control points arrangement or maybe uh, different versions of it. And always when you reset, uh, also try to um, redefine or re-internalize the data from your anchor points. So I'm going to reset now again my my simulation. I'm going to I'm going to run it again. And as you can see here, I returned the points where they were uh, originally, and I resetted the simulation. And now the catenary is running as when it was as how it was before. Okay. Any questions on how I'm running this part of the algorithm? I'm going to change this vector as it was. Okay, if there are not any questions, I'm going to keep going. No problem. Just feel free to, to talk to me if you want me to stop or to repeat any kind of process. You, you, have also, you will have also uh, access to, to the recording of this, of this session, but please feel free to ask uh, in, uh, in case you, you, you have any questions. Okay, so I'm going to make this just... Just for the loads. Okay. Now I have three catenaries. Um, as you could see here, uh, we have a lot of potential on replicability or reusability of the of the algorithm. Uh, there, there is, there is. It's very specific uh, the way the parameters are are working. So. Uh, if you change maybe one number, or if you change maybe the arrangement or the quantity of, of control points and anchor points that you're using, also the unary forces, the vector forces, or the vector direction, you're gonna have always different um, different versions of the catenary. Also have in mind this, the vector doesn't has to be always uh, in a vertical way pointing uh, to point, pointing to, to positive set. You can also have it running uh, backwards by going down and then um, solve maybe um, cases where the gravity is is making uh, the catenary react to it react to it so yeah it, it's it's very versatile versatile in case you want to make uh, not necessarily vertical um, uh, vertical or elevated structures you can also use it maybe for generating the behavior of cables or hanging um, uh, membranes, if you want. I'm going to pause this and I'm going to bake this again. I'm going to put it there. I mean, I didn't do uh, more layers and I need to go faster because we're losing time. Okay, so we have the, those versions of the of the catenary. And now just to finish, I'm going to show you how to do it with a um, custom mesh. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to, to clear all of the values of the of the algorithm, but and not these vector points because I mean at the end it's just a direction. I can use the same right now. Okay, so what could be the process when I want to use a custom mesh? Well, instead of using this part, this this input of surf base, you can use this input. Mesh base. So I'm going to uh, select it and reference it to this component. Set one mesh, and that's it. The process is the same, but you have to um, replace this this connection. Let me just make this a little larger so you can see where in what part of the algorithm I am. 
So right now we have uh, the join mesh component. Oh, I forgot the bifocals. So you can see the components in case you want to read them. Okay. This is the, major, the mesh join component. And right now it's being connected on the input of all of the meshing uh, works for the, for the algorithm. So Kangaroo could read it. So what you have to do just is just um, re uh, disconnect this component, the mesh join, and replace it with the other mesh that you are inputting there. In that way, you are going to have now these uh, initial control points part uh, activated, and you're going to be able to bake it and make the same process all over again. So I'm going to bake these points. And I'm going to bake them on the control points layer. I'm going to close my um, rest hopper, check if the points are there, they are. And then I'm going to uh, select again what are going to be my new control points, my new anchor points from this uh, collection of points that I have already baked. So I'm going to select uh, these, these uh, groups of points. Then I'm going to remember. Uh, copy those objects to this layer. You can do, you, you, you doesn't have to do this. I mean, the, 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 the reason I am, the reason why I am uh, copying those points on the, on the next layer, it's because uh, the layers are helping me to sort the model. It's just that reason. So now that I have the, the control points there, again, I like to, I, I like to, to group them in order to move them however I want but all of them closer. And then I open Grasshopper again and select again these points. I am, I'm selecting them differently as the last, as the last way. Um, right now I just selected them uh, directly, set multiple points and that's it. Now the points are set and now I can run the simulation again. So uh, what you have to, to have in mind when when using right uh, when using kangaroo is that uh, essentially kangaroo is working with meshes. The process behind the the, the process um, back from this part from the mesh component that you have here, it's just a way to convert different kinds of geometry. Uh, so you can be able to make whatever kind of shape from nerves or maybe uh, from composite surfaces or even sub these. Uh, what I will suggest you is that um, you always sketch first what shapes you want to start with and then experiment with them uh, in order to get the different shapes that you want. So now at the end, I'm going to make it a little bit uh, smaller, the linear element length factor. Let me just see. Oh, no, this is what is happening. Oh, okay, it's paused. Sorry. There it is. It's a little bit slow. I'm sorry for the inconveniences. Okay, I'm going to go for maybe 0.2. The vector force is okay. I mean, it's just some shape that I want. It's not. It's not that I'm looking for something exactly. Uh, I'm just doing something, and I'm going to pause the solver so I don't lose more resources on my computer. I'm going to bake it again on another generated catenary layer. And that's it. Okay. So in this way, I was able to demonstrate that not only uh, meshes from surfaces of four points or four sites, but also any kind of mesh is able to be simulated uh, with these behaviors. Any question? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm gonna keep going. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, uh, no questions. Uh, okay. I think, yeah. yeah. We can keep going, no yeah. problem. Thank you, Evelyn. Okay, now I'm going to uh, work with the mesh relaxation example. I'm trying, I'm gonna try to go even faster because <laughs> I'm finishing the time here. Um, it's a little extense, uh, the team. I think that, yeah, this is uh, almost the last one. Okay, so. Here I have the mesh relaxation algorithm. Uh, this algorithm works a little bit uh, different from the last one. Uh, this doesn't have in count, at least in this version, 
and unary force. This only works with with the forces generated by the tension of the of the of the mesh edges and the points themselves. But what we can do here is to define a shape, maybe from a V rep or maybe from a from a mesh that you can generate. But also, I'm gonna have uh, the opportunity to 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 take advantage of the new of these new uh, components of the quadra mesh for the new versions for the newer versions of, of Grasshopper and Rhino. Um, try to use them. I think that they are very uh, interesting in in a way to 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 generate uh, very simple meshes without compromising uh, the quantity of cables maybe, or um, even the softness of the mesh that is gonna be generated because in, in earlier versions of this algorithm, and of course in, in the methodologies that were used for this kind of projects, uh, sometimes you were, you, you, you were using maybe uh, meshes from scratch, made it by you, uh, draw it by line, draw it by hand, or maybe meshes that are not very uh, good um, solved by this component, the mesh B-Rep. Uh, so yeah, let's just try to use this one, the one that, that is on, on the lower part, but you, you are also able to use whatever you want. So what I'm going to do here is to uh, use this same uh, geometry in order to convert this on a quad mesh. Let me just, I'm going to turn off this one. To disable it, just to to work it uh, a little bit faster. So I'm going to set this V rep on this component, and if I turn on the preview here, you're going to be able to see the remeshing of the of the of the mesh. Um, I mean, uh, you can see this uh, travel of the V rep through the mesh V rep component, and then to the quad remesh. The, B -rep, the mesh B rep component is giving me a very simple mesh that is being triangulated uh, on the least on the least number by uh, of triangle of triangular faces by face of, of B rep. So using the quadri mesh gives me a lot of opportunity to have more um, edges. You can also change the settings here. The component for this, um, I mean the. The place of this component, you can uh, you can find it on the mesh uh, ribbon, and in the triangulation um, section. And you can have here the settings if you want to change them. I will not change them. Uh, it's just uh, it's just for 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 making the the geometry. Now, I'm going to turn this off. And then in this part, what I'm doing it's just making sure that the mesh is be, is is well integrated. So I'm, I'm unifying the meshes, I'm joining the meshes and welding them, and also I'm unifying the the the, the normal the normal uh, vectors of the of the mesh itself, in order then to use maybe a smooth mesh in case you are using a very rough mesh, or even the Weaverbeard's Catmull Clark subdivision, if you want even more cables, uh, because now the 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 quadri mesh is giving me a lot of opportunity. Um, I'm going I'm gonna to keep using those. Uh, oh, sorry. There is a question from a student. Yeah. Can we continue? Go ahead, Bablin. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please uh, take the oh. question. So. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a student uh, asking: Can we contour this surface and nest it for fabrication, like your wood wall art project? Yes, we can. Any grasshopper definition you can I, you, I can show. Maybe I'm not gonna have time for that, but I can give you uh, I, I can give you uh, the, the 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 direction of where to go. And I can do that at the end of the of the session, of course. But if you want to to, to look for it right now, uh, Open Nest I think is right now one of the best options, even even be better because it is uh, open source, and you can use it. Uh, actually, this was one. This one is the one that I used for nesting the pieces of the of the wooden lattice. So I will I will suggest you to go for this. I'm gonna try to make a very uh, simple geometry, but I don't promise anything because we don't have time. We only have one half an hour, but I'm gonna try to do it. So yeah, let me just go faster, but thank you for the question. Yeah, openness is the one that you, you're looking for. Okay, so uh, the mesh is being generated uh, and I'm going to enable this component. You can see uh, the information from the mesh is traveling through all of these parts, but we're going to, we're going to make uh, the same uh, process of uh, generating the anchor points for it 
and then use the anchor points uh, for editing maybe the, the, the shape uh, by hand or maybe uh, in, what, in, in another way. What I'm doing here is to extract the, the vertices in, instead of, instead of um, making all of the points or, uh, of, the, of, I mean, instead of making all of the vertices, all of the mesh vertices, what I'm going to do is just extract the naked vertices of the mesh and the naked vertices is go are going to be able, are going to be always on the faces that, on, on, on the places that are not, that the shape is not capped. So what I will suggest is that, um, Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, what I will suggest is that uh, you generate a VREP without, uh, with, with several faces killed from it, uh, maybe exploding it first and then choosing what, which uh, faces you don't want in the, in the shape in order to generate the, the, the anchor points from it. Uh, so now, as you can see here, I don't have this face on the upper part and nor this on the, on the, on the laterals and on the lower part. So, as you can see here on the on the on the B rep that, that is that is being uh, converted to a mesh and then extracted the naked vertices, the points uh, that I'm gonna make are gonna be only those. Okay, you could do even the same thing in the in the in the catenary because this component, the naked vertices, it does that. It does extracts the naked vertices if you want them, but in this case, um, because I'm doing an, a mesh relaxation just for, for an easy demonstration, I'm gonna extract all of them at the same time. So what I'm going to do now is to bake these points and bake them on the uh, control points. Yeah, whatever, it's the same. Uh, what I just want is to have those points. Now, let me just open them. Right now are blue because they are on the control points layer. But at the same time, but uh, uh, as, as the same as I did before, I'm going to group them first, and then change them, change them from from layer when they are done. I'm grouping because I want to control them um, in a more uh, optimal way, a more general, a more general way to move all of the points and the, and and edit the the, the mesh that is going to be generated. Okay, so now the control points are already there. I'm going to uh, clear the values from here because they had they had something before, and now I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose them by hand because there 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 are a few. Uh, I'm going to choose again the control points from here, and select them and set them as anchor points. Oh, they didn't. Wait, what? Oh, I, I, I pressed something. I shouldn't. OK, I right click, set multiple points, and then let's set them. Uh, sometimes Grasshopper does whatever he wants, so be aware of that. OK, now they are set. It. How I know this? Because this component is, it's, um, it has the, the preview on, and if I select it, I can see the points on green. Okay, the anchor points is already uh, are already um, um, sorry are already activated as anchor points in every axis, and then I just have to run the simulation. I'm going to uh, I'm going to hide the the original geometry, and I'm going to hide anything that could be on this part. Okay, it's done. So I run the definition and the mesh is gonna be relaxed. Okay, um, oh, uh, no, oh, no, don't worry, uh, guys. Go, 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 ha have a great day. Uh, gracias por los saludos desde Perú. Igual saludos desde México. And yeah, thank you, Aswin and Alia. Um, let me know if you need something. Just give me a call or maybe hand me a message. Okay, so the mesh is relaxed already. Uh, no, th thank you, thank you, Gustavo. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so now the mesh is relaxed, and now I can do whatever I want with the with the anchor points. So, for example, maybe, I mean, I can move them, as you can see here. Um, also, uh, th there are different ways to 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 simulate this in order to not to have your computer uh, being uh, killed by grasshopper. You can maybe extract only the edges from it. Um, 
and extract them from here and turning off the, the preview. But I wouldn't suggest it anyway because the mesh is already being uh, processed. So you have to do uh, some other kind of process of, of, of logical process in order to extract only the, 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 the mesh edges. So it's the same now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to go a little bit. Uh, what happened? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go a little bit faster. Oh boy, what happened? Wait. Okay, I, I just lost the places. I just wanted to show you that, for example, if you want to scale maybe the, the control points, the anchor points, you can do that as well. The points are already fixed on the, on the mesh and you can just do whatever you want with them. Rotate them in any axis or whatever. I'm gonna finish with this. Let's give Kangaroo some time just to finish the relaxation. And when it's done, I'm gonna pause the simulation and then bake the mesh. I'm gonna put it in here. There is a layer for relaxed meshes in case you want to use them. And here it is. Okay, so far so good. It's, there are very, very easy examples of how to generate uh, meshes with, with a little bit of physics involved on them, on, them on, on, on the morphogenetic aspects of them. And yeah, I'm gonna stop here with the simulations. Uh, if there are no questions, I'm gonna keep going, but I'm just gonna check. No, there are no questions. Okay, let's go for the next part. Okay, we finished with the part of the morphogenetic aspects of the, of the project. Oh, the, uh, thank you, Katan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that, that you're liking it. Um, let me know if you need anything else. Um, okay, so that's enough for generating shapes. I'm going to go to the next part that is going to, that are going to be um, related with fabrication schemes. Remember, just uh, initial aspects of the, of the geometry and measurements from it. Um, you, you, you will be able to see that every, uh, every collection of, of algorithm or yeah, or that data flow are, is starting with, uh, from, a, from a mesh component. That's because um, even if you can um, integrate it uh, already with a, with a physical um, simulation and generate the same, the same data, uh, the same measurement that data at the same time, uh, if you want to go uh, maybe uh, slower with this process and reflecting on it um, in, in, in a more slow way, you can just pre-bake the pre-generate the geometry that you're going to use, and then use these uh, algorithms for that. So right now I have uh, several uh, several um, meshes that already uh, have the information integrated. So I'm going to start with one of the shapes that I did, maybe this one that is the most, no, this one, I think, because I have a lot of information there. And I'm going to select the mesh and then um, set it on this algorithm. I'm going to maximize this. I'm going first on the early data, me data measurement algorithm. I will have here the mesh, um, internalized on the on the on the algorithm and what what this does is two things you can you can check how the mesh can be stripped if you want if you want to maybe deal with that kind of of um, if you want to deal with that kind of, of geometry um, rationalization uh, or you can maybe uh, make some kind of edge interpolation in order to see how to see uh, edges, uh, through all of the, its length in both uh, directions, U and V, and articulate them in order to have maybe um, lines that you can maybe uh, stretch to the extreme of its size and maybe measure where they intersect for uh, further uh, use for, man for, for manufacturing. So, and there are several uh, caveats in this. Remember that uh, different meshes have different uh, uh, processes. So for example, in this case, you will be able to see that the mesh is not very, um, oh, oh no, I think it is. It's just that the mesh is not solving. Yeah, there it is. I'm gonna take down a panel. 
for you to see the list of the meshes that is inside. And what you will be able to see here is that we have um, 21 meshes being represented by one of the by one of their lengths and the counting of each um, um, of each line of tri of triangles or faces of the mesh itself. And they are colored in order to know which one are larger than the other ones. Um, the algorithm is set it for you to see uh, on, on, on a red color, the ones that have more area and in blue, the ones that have less area. And remember, they are divided by strips. So uh, what we are seeing here, it's just uh, this line of faces and the next one and the next one. And you can see it here on the mesh stripping component. This is very simple. It's just a, a mesh stripper component from Kanger triangulated uh, for, for we to, to maybe flatten it in, in, in further steps and then sort it and then define it a new domain for coloring it and then visualizing it. The next, the next part of the, of the algorithm, the edges interpolation, does something uh, quite similar. It's more like a stripper, but in two ways. Uh, this component, the warp, we the warp weft, it's also uh, founded on the kangaroo component. But remember, I'm using two versions of kangaroo here. I know that uh, in, the, in the second version, you can do the same things as in the older versions. But uh, because of this algorithm, it's a little bit old. I, I asked you guys to, to install both of them. But I remember, feel free to, to perfect these, these, uh, these algorithms. These are just bases. And they, are, they have been used by uh, years ago. Um, so yeah. And at the end, what I'm going to get is this kind of information. So let me just take down Grasshopper. You can see uh, two collections of, of curves, the ones that goes along the V direction and the U direction, each of them colored in, in different, um, different color palettes, and also by gradient. In one of the directions, you'll see uh, the blue ones, the cyan ones being the smaller ones and the, and the magenta ones being the largest. And the same with this uh, palette, the yellow ones being the, the, the lower, the, the shortest and the green ones being the largest. So in this algorithm, as, as the title says, it's just only an early data measurement. We are not, um, and, and also in a visual way, we're not measuring them in a very precise way or to use it in, 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 a, in a fabrication step where we can maybe use that information for prototyping or, or something else. It's just a visual, um, a visual artifact for you to understand what is happening with the geometry in different ways of sorting it. Remember, we are, we are working with, 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 ge with geometric hierarchy so we can read and find which are going to be our best opportunities for fabrication. OK, so, oh, sorry, the rest of just frozen. OK. Now, in this part, I already have uh, information uh, internalized. I'm going to show you which. This is the one. I have already this mesh internalized, and then you're going to be able to see this, this data. I'm going to zoom in on it so you can see. This algorithm is giving me uh, each edge independently from each other, and uh, it's being read or interpreted as modules, as, as linear modules. So I'm making a labeling of each, uh, of each edge. I'm separating as well from naked edges and and interior edges, they have different uh, uh, different labeling, and also uh, there is a different reach on numberings. The interior ones, because of, because they are more, that there are more of them. Uh, you're gonna get um, to these kind of numbers, three hundred and seventy one, and then you're gonna get to six hundred and, and seven. Uh, just remember that when you when you uh, take down these kind of projects. Now to, to, to try to, to, to see what, what is going to be happening when you deal with them, materially speaking. Um, this thing will, will tell you how hard it's going to be or how, um, how difficult or laborious because of the quantity of, of, of pieces. Um, I am also integrating, let me just move this mesh 
for you to see the next data. Okay. In this upper part of the algorithm and the model, you're seeing each um, line nested. Let me go to the top view. I'm, I'm making a mess here, sorry. Okay, you're gonna be able to see um, each one of those modules nested in order. You have the interior edge zero, interior edge one, two, and so on, to the last one. And also you're gonna have the naked edges also numbered and labeled and related by color or by uh, length. Um, you have also the opportunity of changing in the algorithm, the way they are sorted. Maybe you want uh, not that many columns or not that many rows. So uh, I, I extracted this from, from Sovin Kavasi's uh, um, generative algorithms, algorithms that go along with the, with the book. I think it's a very nice way to sort um, matrices of, of objects. And for example, here, if I take down this number, I'm gonna make less columns. Just be careful on not to get a number that doesn't match as a multiplier of, of, the, of, the, of the total quantity of, of the length of the list, because you're gonna get uh, this problem. I'm gonna show you. You're gonna overlap the, the, last, uh, the last indexes. So what I will suggest you is to go very large on this number maybe, until you start to see this, just give me one, this, the rows are not complete, but it's okay because uh, the quantity of points that are being used for the uh, for the orientation of each of each of each module, uh, it's complete. So you are not overlapping anything. Okay, so that's the first part. You have inter edges and naked edges. You can have also a way to bake all of this information as text stacks or uh, the custom or, or the the geometry itself. In what way you can use this? Maybe you have, I, I don't know, maybe talking about uh, very, very close prototyping processes. If you have wooden sticks, you can maybe uh, use this information to make a little model for this, uh, for this surface. Or if you want to go um, more serious on the, on, the, on the process, maybe you can integrate this data with uh, another kind or, or, or with, with a more uh, complex algorithm that solves you another kind of, of um, constructive system, maybe uh, spatial nodes, maybe uh, something along the lines of the special structure uh, that I showed you before. Uh, but uh, I mean, there are also a lot of, um, a lot of, of um, considerations on that because you have to integrate more and more information. So at the end, what, what you're looking for here is to, to start from somewhere and then try to go further and further by adding more complexity and more patterns on the, on the data. Okay, the next one that I have here for you, it's the interpolated mesh network. It works at the same way, in the same way as this edge interpolation. It's just a different name because I, 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 I have bad names here. But um, I have here already internalized this data. Let me just take it here. I think this is very useful to uh, make a very fast uh, prototyping of surface in a physical way by using maybe uh, steel wires or maybe um, something that something along uh, uh, modular lines that are flexible. Why? Because uh, the way the information is generated is by interpolated curves. So these kind of curvatures. Um, are, uh, are founded in, in materials that have flexibility. Also remember, we are making an interpolation of a, of a full edge in one direction. So what is useful for us is to know not only the length, the total length of, of, of each edge, but also the points where it intersects and the distance from the origin of that line uh, further to each, one, to each uh, other uh, intersection. So, Again, this is another base for another kind of algorithm that, that might work with uh, linear elements. Uh, I'm, rem I'm remembering maybe, I don't know, 
Shigeru Band's Pompidou project, or maybe uh, a lot, uh, uh, maybe Matsi's uh, pavilion. There was this pavilion from Matsi's that uses this. Uh, uh, we call them here in Mexico listones, um, wooden lines, or maybe uh, bamboo or whatever kind of um, flexible linear module that you that, that you could intersect and join uh, by by knowing where where and and to what distance are the the, the directions. You have the two combi the, the two um, collections of lines um, sorted in this matrix. You have the name of the line and the and the total le length of the line, and then you can you can know in which intersection what other piece on the other on the on the other directions intersects with each other. Okay, now to the hardest part, I think. Hardest because uh, it's a little bit uh, not hardest. It's it's just that it's not very. Uh, it's, it's not as a plug and play uh, way uh, to find to find somehow uh, a method to to unroll surfaces. Uh, we can see, for example, in inter on the internet uh, that uh, there are a lot of algorithms that do that does this very very easy, right? And they are already done and ready to download it from for, for you. But there are some uh, considerations that you have to have when when you are dealing with meshes. Remember that. If you want to enroll something, it needs, uh, in order to fabricate it, it needs to be developable. So you cannot develop um, from surfaces or uh, because, because of, the, of, the, of the nature of the, of the material, maybe that it's not elastic or maybe that, it, that doesn't, that you're not able to, to achieve double curvature with it. Uh, when the nature of that material doesn't matches with the geometry itself, you have to look for ways to solve that. So, one of the ways that normally uh, that, that is normally used by by the people that wants to solve that is by uh, triangulating meshes. Um, what I have here now it's a another part of the algorithms that I have for you. Uh, this is on the lowest part. It's a model generator. This is very simple. What I'm doing just what I'm doing here is just um, extracting the, the mesh edges from the faces from, from the mesh faces. And then extra, extruding them, and then extruding them again with a differentiation on openings. Uh, there is an there is a, a a curve attractor that works as a differentiator of um, of the length and the height of each element. If you want to use it, if you want to go crazy with this, you can go maybe with these kind of things. But the important part here is how you develop these kind of modules. So. Uh, depending on what kind of module you have. Remember, this is just a, a start point for that. You're gonna be um, defining what kind of unrolling you're gonna be using. So even um, just before this, I already have here uh, the IV components um, integrated on the, on the algorithms. For example, here, the mesh unfolding with IV stripper, uh, it's, it's convenient when you have time to, to look for ways to, to segmentate the meshes. Uh, the, the IV libraries has, have a lot of, um, of algorithms of primary segmentation that you can use. Uh, explaining them uh, will be uh, a suicide for me because we don't have time anymore. But uh, I integrated them here with a stream filter in order for you to just choose which one you want to use and to see which one works better with the geometry that you're generating. Uh, you're, you're dealing with the same things. You're just uh, defining the mesh here. Uh, right now I have already something internalized. Uh, defining what kind of, of unrolling mesh mode you're gonna, you're gonna be working on with, because you have um, in several cases, multiple meshes, or in several cases, it's just one mesh. And it depends on, on how many meshes you're dealing with, uh, the way the, the, the algorithms will work. So. Right now, uh, just for you to show, just for me to show you, um, for example, here, I'm going to turn off this. And you're gonna be able to see here the something very similar. It's just a stripping mesh. It's just stripping the mesh in this way. And here are the colors of it, but also uh, by using these algorithms, I can uh, show you how they are gonna be unrolling in case you want to simulate that behavior by using this mesh graph visual unroll. 
remember the the mesh is being triangulated in order to be developable so uh that's why you are ha you're having this triangulation in the mesh so just be careful uh in in what way you're using the the, the, the geometry right now the mesh is are, is not being uh triangulated on the beginning is being triangulated on the next part of the process in this component but uh what you have to do is just uh define what which which measures you want to, en to enroll and then define which uh primary segmentation algorithm to use and then generate the the, the information um the 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 stream filter that i have here and the switch that i have here as well it's integrated as well on the way the mesh unfolding is going to work if you're going to to be enrolling singular meshes or if you were going to to unfold multiple meshes they are already integrated uh, for you to do it in, in the way you choose. So I'm going to show you in the case of using several meshes. Right now I have here uh, the, the meshes already developable, de developed and with the serializations. Uh, they, are very, they are very separated. Um, I didn't integrate it here the, 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 the matrices order for the for the for the pieces but you can do it very 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 easily if you if you if you just see how how this part of the algorithm is is working it's just integrating the 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 items on the list length and then going for orienting the 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 data and the objects in this component by using these new planes that you're that you're defining also uh on the lower part of the algorithm we have um the the fox library stripper that uh, works very, very well, and it's very, very friendly to use. I'm going to show you now. In this way, you're going to see all of the meshes are already unrolled. But remember, I'm triangulating them in order to unroll them. The, the only uh, disadvantage that I have here is that uh, even if it is triangulated and it is unfolded, I don't have um, in in a in a very fast way a way to reference to reference which part of it is of which which phase is the one that is being um, uh, developed from from each module. So um, in this case, what I would suggest you is to go uh, always maybe one by one. I mean, in case you have the time, or maybe look for a way to 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 understand which which. Um, modules are which ones i mean we could uh, I, I could have done <laughs> that by putting the labelings on it but i wanted to i wanted to 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 go faster on on showing you different ways of developing those modules the same process is being used by uh, by by uh, unfolding these modules here that have more uh, geometrical complexity and they are being de uh, developed here in order to um, maybe uh, cutting them or maybe printing them and then cutting them and then assemble them. And yeah, that's it on, on, on a large aspect that, that is, those are the tools that you have here uh, for, for you to use. Um, they are easy to use. They are not uh, very complicated. I know that I, I just made a very uh, fast and very um, shallow uh, demonstration of each of, of those, but uh, if you want to get more into this, please use the models that and, and the algorithms that we're going to offer, that, that we're going to, to, to send you uh, for you to download and use it. And if you have any question and, and if I can help you, please just uh, give me a message and we can talk. And now for um, finishing the question that, that Bablin has, how do you add flaps to the strips? Okay. Um, in Ivy, you have a way to do it. Actually, it is it is being integrated already here, and they should have been appeared here on the on the on on the on the strips. But there is one problem. Remember that we are unrolling different meshes. So because of the mesh, because of the mesh and the and the and the way it's being unrolled, it's not it's not needed more segmentation. So there is no need for joining. That's why I don't have flaps on the on, on the faces. The way that I will do it, if you want to if you want to put uh, to, to to force the flaps on it, it's by drawing them by hand, or by making another kind of segmentation of the mesh. 
maybe by doing it uh, in, a, in, in a more complete uh, way. I can show you how, how, how it works, but uh, changing this maybe could uh, take a little while. But also, I mean, that part, if you want to, to, to use it, it's, it's here. Um, you just have to change. In case you are using one mesh, you just, you just have to change the version on singular mesh and then have a different kind of segmentation for the flaps to appear. But also uh, something that I will suggest you in case uh, you find this difficult, try to explore also uh, further outside of Grasshopper or outside Rhino. Um, there, there are several uh, programs that already um, are optimized for these kind of projects where you have to uh, unfold, unfold uh, several meshes or several kind of geometry. This one is called Pepakura. And this one, uh, th this is one project that, I'm, th that I actually uh, showed my students in the university where I, where, where I give lectures. What I have here is not only uh, one, one shape of, 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 of a specific complexity, but also it has a texture in it. Uh, this can be done also on Grasshopper. There are, there are several components that um, integrate uh, textures or drawings, vectors on the pieces. And you're going to find them on the different uh, components and libraries that we already shared with you. But if you want to check a Pepakura Designer, I will suggest you to use it. It's very, it's very, very handy. You just have, it's almost, uh, it's almost click and play. You just have to, to, to press the unfold, the unfold uh, button. And on the right side, you can see how the, the mesh is being unfolded. You only have to change maybe the settings of the flaps, for example, or maybe uh, the numberings of the faces and how the faces are being related with each other. And also you have the opportunity to maybe uh, sort or rotate or disjoin the faces to make more segmentation on the, on the component. Now, Pepakura, is, is this free to download and use? It isn't, So, but it is very cheap. I mean, uh, what, what, what I wanted to show you here is one, another service that, that exists for you to, to, to make uh, mesh unfolding and mesh segmentation in case you want to do it even more um, faster. But it can be also developed on Grasshopper, of course. The, the components that I, that I already have here are the base for that, for that methodology. But uh, as, as, as I'm saying you, in a practical point of view, I will suggest you to go further from, from Grasshopper. Um, for example, Pepakura is being used a lot by people that does a lot of cosplay or want to make uh, fantasy modeling. So the, the shapes that you can uh, achieve with this, with this uh, software, even if they are very complex, of course, it depends on the topology and the, and the complexity of them, uh, are very achievable. And you have a lot of options about um, uh, the settings and the print papers, you, you have a lot of, of, of options about, uh, of, about using different kinds of papers, different kinds of, of, of uh, printing resolutions, etc. And yeah, that's, that's it. I think that we run out of time. Pauline? Yeah, uh, I think yeah, there's, uh, there's some problem. Um, um... I think we have another question. What is the best way to export to Peppercura? Okay, good question. Can you question. maybe address that before I begin uh, a series of questions with you? Then? Of course, actually I can do this with these models. For example, I can um, take this uh, different, actually uh, th there is one consideration that I will suggest you as well. Uh, don't export everything at the same time. Try to go, uh, lower on the quantity of meshes or geometry that you're going to generate uh, and, and unfold on, on Pepakura. About formattings and, and that kind of, of, of considerations, uh, go to export selected. When you select wh whatever you want to, to export, let me go just to the, to the folder. And I will suggest you to select the OVJ uh, format or the, let me see if it is here, FBX Motion Builder, whichever you want to from, from here. Why? Because if you have any kind of texture applied to the geometry, in both of the, of the, of the formats are gonna be able to be readable, but Motion Builder is it's more uh, optimal for that. 
So right now I don't have any any texture. So I'm going I'm going to go for OBJ. Um, I'm going to put whatever name here. The options for the settings. Um, the only one that has a a very uh, important uh, impact on the on the options is a map C the map Reno Z to object to to OBJ. Why? Why? Because maybe you want to use the model um, oriented in the way you 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 model that. So mapping the 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 set coordinate in the model could be useful or not. It depends on the on, on the on the thing that you're doing. And also, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, the mesh export vertex colors. Maybe the vertex colors is something is some other information that you want. But the, I think this one is uh, is most critical for that. You press OK. The mesh is already uh, imported, exported, I mean. And then you just look, go for file on Pepacura, open the file that you want, and then let's go and look for the one that I just exported. I'm sorry, let me just look for it. It's far, far from there. Okay. Uh, you're gonna find your OBJ or your FEX, whatever uh, file you, you you exported it. Then the the software is gonna open all of it, and you're gonna choose if you want to flip the normals or not. I I wouldn't do it because sometimes the the objects that you use maybe have some kind of direction defined by the designer. And when you have the the information here, you just press unfold and then try to change all of the parameters. Of the of the project right now, maybe it's because it came out with the with the texture. Um, but it's just a matter of changing or uh, taking out the texture from the model. Maybe it's because I put the vertex on it. Let me just do this again one more time, just to make sure that was a problem. I'm gonna put here. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna take out the texture and the render meshes. The formatting, it's okay. I'm going to do it again. File, open. Unfold. It's happening the same. It happens when uh, you have some kind of material defined on the model. Maybe it's because it's taking the uh, material of the of each mo of, of each model from the layer. But uh, here I could uh, I have a, a better example of it being textured uh, consciously and being unfolded with the texture itself. Um, so yeah, maybe if you want, I can. Um, Share with you this model as well if you want. It uh, I wouldn't mind if you don't mind, Bailey. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, of course, of course. Perfect. Uh, one more question. Nurbeli Lita. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Can I import from Maya? Import from Maya to what um, software or what uh, format? To Rhino, for example? Yes, you can. You can do it by using OVJ formats. Let me just show you what you can import here in Rhino. Import. All of these supported files as you see here, maybe this way. All of these are the formats that, that are supported by Rhino. So Maya, for example, uh, the, the native uh, format that Maya uses is not readable on Rhino, but you can use, for example, FVX. That's a very that's a very well integrated format for the, to, for you to use. Uh, in Rhino, if you are if you are generating uh, geometry in Maya, uh, actually OVJ or FVX right now it's like the most standard way to import different models and different uh, with different complexities uh, along almost every uh, CAD software that that focus on three D modeling and texturing. So yeah, FVX and OVJ could be the ones for you. Yeah, I hope the question was not uh, how to import from Maya to Paper Cura. So in case that's the case, that uh, does it mean we can uh, import the OBJ file itself? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, it's almost the same. Uh, oh, Rhino, yeah. and yeah, it's just because uh, the standardization of those both of both um, formats. Okay. Uh, I think maybe while uh, we get some more questions, I I thought uh, maybe I could ask a few questions myself. For sure. Um, yeah. I think the workflows that we've been talking about is uh, very interesting because um, at some point when we are doing uh, grasshopper modeling and we are generating form, it's all, it also becomes important on how do you fabricate these things. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you, if you would want to just throw a little bit more light on your experience on how rapid prototyping with paper in your projects has kind of also given you a bit more flexibility with your uh, grasshopper models and how does it inform your final scale fabrication process? So maybe you would want to share with students a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm gonna go back to my university years. Um, just, just, for you to show, just for me to show you, um, let me just look for that. If not, uh, well, forget it. Um, the, the thing is uh, using, I mean, and, First of all, um, having in mind the, the this this question about the hierarchy, the geometrical hierarchy of the of the of the systems that I'm using or that I'm that I want to build, I think is the most important part. But knowing as well that I have uh, I have in my on my reach uh, a material so a material that loyal as as a paper, as an as an analog for another kind of materials that have uh, almost the same properties, for example, rigidity, rigidity uh, but at the same time, foldability, and at the same time, uh, the softness enough, or maybe the rigidity uh, when, I, when, I, um, when I fold it in several ways, uh, it can give me the way, in a, it, it can give me an opportunity to, to in a scalar way, um, simulate different kinds of materials. So knowing that it uh, gives me a lot of a lot of agency uh, when I want to deal with different materials. For example, um, if I want to to simulate maybe uh, metal sheets with paper, what I just have to look is for a for a for a harder paper maybe, or maybe for 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 a paper that that doesn't bend too much that that has in a scalar way the 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 a a, a analog resistance. Maybe uh, maybe I'm not being too clear. It's for example, if you are building something something with metal, you look for something very very strong or very foldable in in case you want to to look for ways for it to fail, for example. Mm -hmm. Or when you want to build with wood, maybe not paper, but wood is is even more uh, easy to use and also it's more directly uh, related to the final. Uh, Material aspect and the matter and the final systemic behavior of, 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 of the of the project. But for example, using Pepakura in, in in my personal case has been one of the most um, uh, satisfactory ways to learn how uh, how the geometry uh, unfolds and also develops. And also, for example, in this case, if I want to do this, not maybe not with paper, but maybe with uh, plastic or maybe with some other kind of material that has to be uh, passed through, uh, through a CNC or maybe through a, through a very, through, through, a, through a more industrialized way of manufacturing it. I just have to take out the, 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 the flaps, maybe take out the, the colors, maybe take out the serialization or change it, or maybe making jumps. Maybe I can use this, this pattern on Grasshopper to develop some other uh, geometries or some other aspects, geometrical aspects for it to work on different uh, scales and, and materials. So it's more like knowing when to jump and how to jump when, when, com when comprehending the, the, the geometrical hierarchy that you're dealing with in each project. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I think uh, even what, what becomes important is that uh, uh, how do these grasshopper workflows uh, help you to maybe uh, become more efficient in terms of not just the material, but also the time consumed for construction? So do you have any of the experiences which you can maybe share with the, some of the old works that you have done where you found out that grasshopper has actually helped you to reduce the construction time 
and the laborious kind of work. So, not not only the time the the, the time uh, but the costs. Not not only the costs, but the time. But also, it, it gave me a problem. For example, in this in this project in the in the planetary, um, we were able to generate the information in one month yeah. for all of the project in an executive way. I mean, uh, uh, fabrication drawings, fabrication schematics, <laughs> the the calendar and the schedule of the of the, of the construction project uh, started to crumble because of how fast we were able to generate the geometry. I mean. It can be an advantage, of course, whenever, uh, as as long as you as you um, coordinate the the times and the and the potential of the of the of the of the tools that you're using, but it also can become something um, something disadvantages because maybe you are going faster than another uh, than, than another contractors on the process, and for example, in the case of the of the planetary, when we finish it to to assembly all of the project. Uh, the contractors that were doing the floorings with con with reinforced concrete needed to be braid the the floor, so that will be uh, very harmful for the for the glasses. We needed to go for for look for reinforcement for each piece, and that only happened because we didn't knew how fast we were going with this project. Yeah. So that is like another like the, the, the another extreme of the of the of the part. But if you have a good uh, coordination and a good uh, scheduling on, and also comprehend the potential of, the, of your tools, you can go, uh, you can go very, very uh, easily and very uh, comfortable on the ways this is generated. But also have in mind this, uh, and th this has been used a lot by, by this uh, teacher that taught me this kind, this, uh, a lot of these things. Don't try to kill a fly with a nuclear weapon. It's like having a lot of potential it's maybe more harmful when you are dealing with projects that are more close to the conventional aspects. So it's more like going for a very humble way to look for the project and to see where you can apply several uh, solutions, but not, not try to go and try to solve everything with these tools because there is a lot of uh, different complexities involved in this. Like for example, the lack of reading the lack of, of uh, resources for, for generating information, the lack of understanding, etc. Maybe that also kind of addresses what uh, Marius has, uh, had asked uh, in the beginning of our session as well. So in case uh, Marius is around and uh, it kind of addresses his uh, question, that will be great, right? Yeah. Um, I think, yes, it's, it's quite interesting uh, what, uh, what uh, you have shared and it's quite generous of you to share your workflows uh, and I, I think with with so many uh, plugins coming uh, for use and everything available for free uh, Grasshopper and uh, the Allied kind of plugins have helped us a lot to uh, make our workflows much more uh, easier and I can yeah. only uh, expect uh, students to come up with even more interesting forms uh, but in case anyone wants to reach out to you, Roberto, uh, where can they reach out? How can they follow you? If you can just throw a little bit light on that. Yeah. Okay, I have an Instagram where I upload all my all of my work. It's uh, it's here. It's Roberto Arguelles. Everything uh, sticked together, and this is it. And I have a Twitch where I where I'm normally working on very experimental things. I am very interested as well on, on specular uh, architecture. I, I mean, in my work, I normally deal with, so, with construction solutions and, and complex geometry solutions, but I also like uh, the, the very uh, flying architectural thing of, of, of these of the, of this, um, disciplines. So yeah, I, I normally try to do that on my Twitch more like a pastime and I also, you can also look for the webpage of Sinolab, but I, I can, I can share that with you later because we are changing of, we're migrating the, the webpage and we're changing the, the domain. So uh, whenever I have it ready, I'm going to pass it to you, Bablin, but this could be maybe enough for you to reach me and whatever you need, I'm at your service. 
Thank yeah. you so much, Vladimir, for this yes. opportunity. Thank you. And uh, before we leave, I'll just uh, very quickly just uh, remind our audience. So, uh, Roberto, can you stop your share? I'll I'll just share the. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Share. Sorry. Yeah. Thank no. you so much. I think I can't thank you enough for uh, making uh, this tutorial so easy for students to understand. And I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of uh, queries. Um, so just to quickly, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yes, just to quickly uh, summarize uh, onto onto today's session. Uh, please find all the relevant documentation for this session on uh, our Digital Futures YouTube channel. Uh, you can follow the channel, subscribe to it and find not even today's tutorial, but many other discussions, sessions and many other uh, tutorial series that have happened in past. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to have another session uh, on the topic of AI, neuroscience and architecture with Professor Neil Litch in, uh, in coordination with the Florida International University. Vanyuhi is going to be presenting her uh, work and talking about uh, uh, AI and uh, her work at X school. Uh, our March events are lined up and we have a set of very interesting 13 sessions planned out, including some of the topics like clay, clay painting in architecture, uh, our first Portuguese session on uh, new hybridities in the po Portuguese diaspora, uh, and uh, many more uh, uh, tutorials and sessions, both in Spanish and in English. Um, if you're interested in joining the team, please uh, feel free to reach out at info at the rate digital futures dot uh, world. Please subscribe to our channel on uh, Discord and Discord community is, is just growing for us. And uh, we are more than happy to welcome anyone who plans to join. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert. Thank you, thank you so much to all the, all the participants and we'll see thank you, you soon next week. Thank you. See ya. Yeah, bye-bye. Nos vemos, cuídense.